reflecting on this first church, the, Ephes, uh, the church at Ephesus. I'll read the text and I'll give you my title. Verse 1, follow along please. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else... I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, thou that hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Notice please for my thought tonight in verse... Number four, nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left, left thy first love. I'm preaching tonight on the subject of uh, how far have you drifted? How far have you drifted? Here's a church that drifted away uh, from their love, their, their love for the Lord, their love for God had waned uh, to a place of coldness. They drifted away. Father, bless now the reading of your word and use the message you've given me to be a help to God's people in this place. Bless our pastor and his family as they travel. Give them rest in their souls and safety as they come back to us this week. And uh, tonight, use the word of God to speak to us individually. And we know that this message to this church thousands of years ago still has an application for us tonight, our church right here in 2023. Bless our church. Help our church not to be guilty of drifting. Help God's people in this place uh, to stay close to the Lord. And use this message, we pray, in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen and amen. The city of Ephesus <clears throat> was one of the chief capitals of the prince province of Asia. This was a, a center of religious religion uh, and a commercial center of the region. In the city of Ephesus, we know, according to Acts chapter 19, the temple of Diana was in this city, one of the seven wonders of the world at that time. And it was here in this uh, prestigious place that the Apostle Paul would start the first church in Ephesus. And he would serve there for several years, a ministry of about three years and then he would <clears throat> train Timothy, his spiritual son in the faith, to take the first church at Ephesus, and Timothy became the first pastor of this great church. Now, some of Paul's great accomplishments were, uh, and greatest works were in this place. And you can read about this on his third missionary journey in Acts chapter 19. And we'll go to that in just a moment. Acts chapter 19, verse 1 through 10. I want to start tonight by saying, number one, I want you to consider the admiration, the admiration of this church. There's some good things I just read to you about this church. And let's go over these in just a moment in our mind's eye, and may the Lord help us to have understanding. There's some desirable qualities about this church. And first of all, notice the Spirit of God says, I know something. I know something about the church. By the way, God knows our church. God knows the members of our church. God knows you tonight. God knows your heart. He knows the very thoughts and intents of our hearts. And the Spirit of God says, I know thy works. Notice this church had good works. Verse number two, I know thy works. Now, this was a church that made a difference in their city. This was a church that Change the hearts and strengthen homes. I know thy works. And their works were influential. They, it swept away the sin of idolatry. And if you turn back in your Bibles, would you look back 
please, in Acts chapter 19. Let's go ahead and look at it while we're here. And this was the first, this was the church at Ephesus. Paul's work is found here. It's disciples. He found certain disciples in verse number one. And uh, all the way down, look down with me, please. In verse number 13, there were certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, and look upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. The name of the Lord Jesus saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And notice uh, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Who are you? And the man that had the evil spirit was leapt on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Notice this. Many also of them which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted them the price of them, and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. And so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. If you look on down further, you'll see a riot took place because of what God was doing in this place. A riot took place. And this church affected and influenced the city. Uh, this was a place that, that, that the uh, silversmiths, uh, made a lot of idols, and people were throwing their idols in the fire. <laughs> and it affected the businesses of the city. Think about this. New converts began to throw away their idols to the goddess Diana. It affected the businesses in the city. It caused a riot. By the way, thank God for a church that has an impact on a city. Amen? Thank God for a church that has an impact on a city. And thank God for our church, this church that we're a part of. And we know that we're making an impact in the place that God has planted this church. Thank the Lord for that. We are the salt of the earth. And a church that's doing the right thing will impact and influence a city for God. You ever thought about that? What kind of influence are we making in the lives of people? If you were to take this church and... Go five miles in circumference and draw a circle within a five-mile radius of this church. Think about how many people need a ministry like this. Somewhere in that five-mile circle, there's a home that Satan wants to break up. Somewhere in that five-mile radius, there's a teenager that has experienced drugs for the first time. Or maybe pornography for the first time. Somewhere in that five-mile circle, someone is contemplating suicide. As we meet together tonight, they're thinking of ending their life. And think about the impact and influence of God's people if we do what God has called us to do. We are the salt of the earth. But when the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be trodden under the foot of men. And may God help us to continue to be salty and distinctive in this day and age. Amen? Come on now. Uh, I, I'm, am I preaching to the right church tonight? I need to go outside and check the sign again. Is this community Bible Baptist church? May God help us to make a difference in this place. And I want to see God do great things here. And this church can be commended. They're, they're admirable and admiration because of their good works. Notice also their labor. The Bible says not only good works, but it says, and thy labor. <coughs> their labor refers to the toils and struggles. Labor is what produces the work of God. Dr. Curtis Hudson used to say, the work of God cannot be built on pocket, spare time and pocket change. It takes labor. It takes toil. Nothing can be accomplished in the work of God until somebody decides to pay the price to see it done. Somebody must pay the price. And these believers were able to bless. They were able to labor because they were willing to bleed. They were willing to bless. They did not sit at ease in Zion, but they put forth an effort. And the Lord was saying that these people had 
basically exhausted themselves in doing labor and the work of God. <coughs> you think about <clears throat> those believers in the house of Stephanus over in the book of 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 15 or 16. Paul writes and commends the believers in the house of Stephanus <clears throat> because they had addicted themselves to the ministry. That's an interesting word, isn't it? They've addicted themselves to the ministry. And I want to be the, a, a believer that is addicted to the ministry of God. And here's a church that had exhausted themselves in labor for the Lord. He commends their good works. He commends their labor. He commends their patience. Notice verse 2, and thy patience. By the way, this must have been an outstanding quality of this church because it's mentioned twice, their patience. And they were not just sitting idly by. Uh, they had the kind of patience that endured. They had the kind of patience that moved forward. They had the kind of patience that, that, uh, that while under persecution, they refused to give up. Their patience is mentioned. Then notice verse number 2. <clears throat> and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. I think there's an admirable quality here. Their vigilance. Their vigilance is mentioned. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think I put that on my notes up there. I may have skipped it by accident. But their vigilance. In other words, this was a church that was known for the defense of the faith. When false teachers came in and... and uh, <clears throat> Rather, when evil came in, thou canst not bear them which are evil. This was a church that was zealous about the truth. They knew what they believed. They knew why they believed what they believed. And they rejected any false doctrine and any false teacher that came down the pike. They possessed a holy hatred for sin and compromise. And they would never put these things above truth. This was a church that could not bear them which were evil. The Bible goes on to say they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's a whole other message. <coughs> Pardon me. Notice their discernment is commended. Verse 2, Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. In other words, they examined the leaders of the church. They rejected them that did not preach truth. By the way, uh, there'll be a lot of people out of a job tonight if we uh, took that same method across our land. We've got false prophets and false teachers and, and false apostles <clears throat> standing up in pulpits and television programs all across our land making false prophecies. By the way, in the Old Testament, if you told people you were a prophet and you made a prophecy and your prophecy did not come true, they took you out and stoned you. I think that's a good idea today. People standing up and trying to prophesy. The God said to me that the Lord is coming. Jesus is coming on November the 11th. And November the 11th comes and goes and the Lord hasn't come. And the Lord didn't tell that false prophet he was coming. Amen? The Bible says it very clearly. No man knows the day nor the hour when the Lord, Son of Man, shall come. This church had a great, some great qualities, vigilance, spiritual discernment, and per perseverance. Verse number 3, and has not fainted. In other words, they didn't become discouraged and quit. Uh, it became known as a growing church. They didn't just grow weary and well-doing, but they fainted not. And these are great, <clears throat> admirable qualities of a church. The admonition is given. And by the way, <coughs> we could close our Bibles right now and go home and say, this is a great, commendable church. We ought to pattern our, our lives after this. Our church ought to be a church full of good works, full of labor, full of patience, full of vigilance, full of discernment, full of perseverance. These are commendable things. But not only do I see in this text an admiration, but I see an accusation. The accusation of this church. Notice please with me verse number 4. Nevertheless, 
Nevertheless, God not only sees the good, but He sees the bad. Nevertheless, God not only commends, but He corrects. Nevertheless, <coughs> I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. This is the accusation. Verse 1 tells us the Lord was in the midst of this church. He saw the good. He saw the bad. He closely examined their works. And he observed something. Though they were dedicated, though they were fulfilling duties, they had waned in their devotion, their love. They drifted. They drifted. The Lord not only knows our conduct, but He knows the condition of our heart. And here's a church that had drifted. They left something. My question tonight, the title of this message is, How far have you drifted? How far have I drifted? Am I where I should be? Are you where you ought to be in your spiritual life? As you look back at 2022 and you think about all the good and you think about the bad and you think about, you, you take spiritual examination. We examine ourselves. <clears throat> Whether we be in the faith, we examine our works. And is the Lord pleased? Is God pleased at where we are? Have we drifted away from where we know we ought to be in our Christian life? The accusation, thou hast left thy first love. <clears throat> in other words, their position had not changed. They're standing right. But what had changed is their passion. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Their passion had changed. They, they, they're no longer passionate about the Lord Jesus, loving the Lord. They left something. And this is not something I'm saying. This is something the Lord said about this church. Jesus said, you've left your first love. Notice, they did not lose it, they left it. They were so concerned about spiritual activity that they neglected a spiritual life. They left something. And I want to tell you something tonight. Churches do not usually get where they are overnight. It's usually a, not a sudden departure. That's the problem. It's not a sudden departure. It's a slow drifting. That's the problem. Amen. I'm preaching it right tonight, whether you say amen or not. It's a, it's a slow drifting that's the problem. He said, you left your first love. What is the first love? <clears throat> I believe the first love is our love at the first. Our love at the first. Think about your Christian life. I mentioned this morning, the day that I was saved, August the 17th, 1982. And I remember those days after my conversion. I remember... I remember my heart and my passion, my zeal as a teenager. And God didn't just save me at that camp, but God saved 16 other teenagers at that camp. And we got off the back rows of our church and we started sitting down front. We started paying attention to the preacher. We stopped passing notes. We started bringing our Bible. We started coming to the altar. I'm talking about my love at the first of my Christian life. Think about your love at the first. Think about it. And Christian activity that neglects fellowship with the Lord <coughs> turns into spiritual pride. Our service becomes prideful to us. We get away from loving the Lord like we did it the first time. The first love is that complete devotion to Christ, not just religious duty. To leave our first love means that we no longer love the Lord like we did at the first of our Christian life. We drift away into coldness and indifference. It can be compared to the honeymoon days of marriage. <laughs> How many remember the day you got married? Raise your hand. Yes. My wife and I, Mandy and I, were sitting at a table today with uh, two of our church members. And <clears throat> we were talking about marriage and everything. How long have you been married? And we both said 33 years. This coming March will be 34 years. And, I said, and one of them <clears throat> said, well, that's pretty good. 
that you know that so quickly. I answered before my wife did. And I said, well, the reason I know so quickly is I put it on my ring right here. It says, it's got my wedding date engraved, 3-18-89. And I put that on there so I don't forget, right? (laughs) But I remember when my wife and I got married, March the 18th, 1989. And I remember love at the first. How many remember, come on now, you remember love at the first of your marriage? I'm talking about the honeymoon days. And we got married on a Saturday at Victory Baptist Church in North Augusta, South Carolina. And I just received the call to go to a church in Cumming, Georgia, the Sharon Baptist Church. And 19 of the teenagers sat right here in the front row, first two rows. And they were witnesses of our union, our marriage. And I knew that when I came off the honeymoon, these would be the young people I'd be ministering to. And God used us, and we were able to stay there for about three years. And I remember those honeymoon days and how we were so endearing to each other. And then I remember when we had our first knockdown, drag out, drag out, whatever fight you call it, you know. I'm talking about a real doozy. When when her mom and dad are nowhere to be found and my mom and dad are nowhere to be found, you can't call mom and dad. You got to settle this between you and her. And we had our first fight if you will. I'm not talking about something abusive. I'm talking about fussing, you know, hollering a little bit and and disagreeing a little bit. You may be sitting here all pious. Well, I've never had a fight with my wife. I don't believe that for one minute. Not one minute. Not one minute. And uh, all of us have the ups and downs and ins and outs of marriage. I remember that. But you know, 33 years, I've learned how to fight a little better, right? I'm a little wiser now. The Bible says, dwell with him according to knowledge. And uh, and it's not like that way anymore. Just recently we had a little fuss and she came crawling to me on her hands and knees. And she said, get out from under that bed and fight like a man. (laughs) That's just a joke. That didn't really happen. But anyway. (laughs) But the honeymoon days. I remember those days. That devotion. Mary and Martha had that. Jesus said to Mary and Martha, you've chosen the good thing, a good thing here. Mary chose the good thing. And leaving the first love is the accusation that the Lord made against this church. And I think about our life tonight, spiritually speaking. How far have we drifted from the love at the first of the Christian life? At the first of the Christian life, I was preaching in a nursing home service at the age of 16, just a, maybe six or seven months after my salvation. I was preaching in a nursing home service. I did that every Saturday, <coughs> <coughs> and one turned into two and three, and before I knew it, they hired me at the church at 19 years old. I was on staff at the church. And I was preaching, by the time I got married, I was preaching 11 times every week. Six nursing homes and five daycares. I came into daycare ministries and had a 30-minute program with a little Billy Bob, a little mannequin, and we would sing, and I would give a little lesson to children. And God opened some great doors. And I remember just early in my Christian life, walking down the corridor to preach in that nursing home service, And I remember diving into a little bathroom in the hallway and falling to my knees and saying, Oh God, use me, help me as I preach to these folks today. I need your power, I need your strength, I need your anointing. And then you come 33 years later, do I still have that passion to lean upon the Lord or can I lean on my own flesh? I think when you've done it as long as I've done it and as long as some of you've done it, it's easy to rest on your laurels and to trust in your, put confidence in in your own strength. That's the battle we fight as Christians. Am I walking in the flesh or am I walking in the spirit? Am I leaning on my own strength or am I trusting in the Lord to enable me, to help me? to accomplish the work of God. That's something all of us have to face and fight on a daily basis. 
I see number three, the advice. God gives an advice to this church. He gives three things. Notice, please, <clears throat> he says in verse 5, remember from whence thou art fallen. Then he says, number two, repent. Then he says, and do the first works, or for alliteration's sake, repeat. Go back and repeat. Go back and do again what you used to do, the first works. And this is the advice that the Spirit of God gives to this church. Remember from whence thou art fallen. The Lord is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And He's telling the church to remember where you got off track. Remember where you drifted from. Recall the place of those precious honeymoon days and that new, of that newfound faith. Reflect on those days when our love for Christ consumed us. He said, remember those days. Then he said, repent. In other words, the purpose of remembering should, is to lead us to repentance. Are you listening? The purpose of remembering is to lead us to a place of repentance. We must confess our cold indifference and our lack of love for the Lord. And then he said, this is the advice that is given. He says, and do the first works. Repeat. Go back and do the first works again. Go back and start over. Go back at the first. All of us ought to go back to Bethel and renew our fellowship and devotion with God. Repeat the first works that we did at the first of our Christian life. I'm talking about reading the Bible. I'm talking about memorizing Scripture. I'm talking about meditating on the Word of God. I'm talking about praying longer than just 30 seconds for a meal. I'm talking about witnessing, boldness, speaking to others about what God has done for us in our lives. Speaking the truth in love. I'm talking about being faithful to church. I'm talking about giving. I'm talking about sacrificing. I'm talking about laboring. Go back and repeat these things. <clears throat> That's the advice. And then lastly, we see the application for our church. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And though this was written thousands of years ago, there's something here for us tonight. This is, can be applied. This can be profitable for us. What can we take home from this? What's the application? Charles Haddon Spurgeon said that the sermon hasn't begun until the application begins. The sermon hasn't begun until the application begins. How can we apply this to our lives tonight, to our church? By the way, you are the church. You're the church. I'm the church. I'm part of this church. At the beginning of the first century, the church loved the Lord. They loved one another. They loved the lost. By the end of the first century, they left their first love. Satan gained a foothold. He, they gave him a place. And I think there's some things we can take home. First of all, and this is kind of small on the screen, but <clears throat> not it's because I typed it, but <clears throat> we should never put our service for Christ ahead of our love for Christ. We should never put our service for Christ ahead of our love for Christ. When Peter failed the Lord and he was given a second chance, the Lord came walking on the water to his disciples and he had a meal with them, on, ate a fish meal on the, the banks. And Jesus would look at Simon Peter, who denied him three times, and Jesus gave him three times to make it right. He said, lovest thou me more than these? I think he was pointing to the fish on the fire, and Peter's thinking about going back, and he had already done some of that. Lovest thou me more than these? And Peter said, Lord, thou knowest I love it. Feed my lambs. Lovest thou me three times? The Lord Jesus spoke to the real problem 
The real problem was his love. He had drifted. And I say to you tonight, it's so easy for us to put what we do for God ahead of our love for Him. Listen carefully. Busyness in the king's business is no reason to neglect the king. Amen? And we get so busy in the king's business that we neglect the king. There's a verse in the scripture somewhere. Dr. Mills can help me find it later. But I think it says, Thou hast made me keepers of the vineyards, but mine old vineyard have I not kept. That's in the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> Trust me, it's in there. Thou hast made me keepers of the vineyards, but mine old vineyard have I not kept. And that's a dangerous place is when our service for Christ gets ahead of our love for Him. <clears throat> the second application I see here is the church that loses its love will eventually lose its light. Now listen carefully to the warning of Scripture. Jesus said, or else, or else. It's one thing when I say, do this or else. It may not, it may not <coughs> bring about much fear at all. But when the Lord says, do this or else, you better pay attention. And He says, or else, I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. What is that all about? Well, it's about the church that has lost its love. If they don't remember, if they don't repent, if they don't go back and repeat, Jesus is going to remove their light. And the church is not just to be salt that's distinctive, but the church, the Bible says, is a light that is set on a hill. Tonight we're all a part of this great church, Community Bible Baptist Church, and our church is a light on the hill in this part of our country. I want to tell you something. A consequence could come to where the church is no longer becomes the light because the Lord removes our opportunities. When a light bulb, when a light bulb loses its power, to shine, we toss it away, we throw it away. It's no longer doing what it was created to do. And the tragedy, the tragedy of the church at Ephesus is that their light was removed and their ability to influence the city and to have a testimony in a dark place was taken away. They tell me today in the place where Ephesus is today, it is years ago has been overcome by Muslims and Islamic movement, Islam. The church at Ephesus lost its light. It lost its light. I, I take away a third thing from this passage. <coughs> a genuine love for Christ will make a difference in our work, in our labor, in our patience. Would you go back with me in your Bibles in closing? I want you to look back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Would you turn back there with me? I want you to see something. I want you to look at it. And make a, hold your place in Revelation chapter 2. Hold your place there and flip back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. <coughs> I want you to make a comparison here in your, in your heart and mind. Look at this. See it for yourself. Notice something about this church here. Remembering, verse 3, without ceasing your work of what? Come on now, help me read it. Your work of what? And your labor of what? And your patience of what? Hope. Now we turn to Revelation and something's missing. It's not a work of faith, it's just work. It's not a labor of love, it's just labor. And it's not patience of hope, it's just patience. 
And I want to tell you something tonight. There's a big difference between a work of faith and just work. There's a big difference between a labor of love and just labor. I hope you have spiritual eyes to, and ears to understand what I'm saying tonight. There's a big difference between patience of hope and just patience. Now, I'll tell you something that happens to churches all across our land. Our pastor graduated from Tennessee Temple University. I'm very fond of that ministry. My wife grew up there from first grade to 12th grade. My Mandy grew up at Highland Park Baptist Church, and she was under the ministry of Dr. Lee Robertson, the largest independent Baptist church in our country. Before the word mega church was ever coined, they were running 11 to 13,000 people in Sunday school classes. They didn't count the worship services like we do here. You know, we count how many people came Sunday morning. They only counted Sunday school classes. You turn in a report, here's how many we had, add it all up. We had 13,000 in Sunday school. That's not including the people that skipped Sunday school and showed up for church. We got people like that everywhere, right? I'm talking about an influential church. I'm talking about... Tennessee Temple Bible College. I'm talking about schools and over 40 chapels that were owned all across that. I'm talking about city blocks that were owned by that ministry. Many of you know the story. You go right now to Bailey Avenue in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and there is no more Tennessee Temple College. There is no more Highland Park Baptist. It's all gone. After Dr. Robertson left, there was other pastors that came in behind him and began to change the version of Scripture, began to change the work of the ministry there. And God took His hand of blessing off of that ministry. And that church folded. It's no longer there. If you would have said in 1980 and 1985 that this great mega church will one day no longer be in existence, it'll no longer be here. People will laugh you off the, off the street. But I'm saying that when a church ceases to be a work of faith, and when a church ceases to be a labor of love, when a church ceases to be patiently hoping for the Lord Jesus, it's in a dangerous place. And my last takeaway from this is we should never delay in getting back to where we need to be spiritually. Never delay. Notice the word quickly. I like that word. <laughs> Do it quickly. By the way, some of you tonight have drifted. Have drifted. I don't know how far. The question is, how far have you drifted? But may I say to you, without delay, quickly, quickly, without delay, we ought to get back to that place of spiritual blessing and spiritual renewal that we know we ought to be. Amen? If we've drifted, we can come back to that place of blessing again. We can go back to that place of fellowship once again. And if you're going to do it, do it quickly. May God help us. Would you bow your head in prayer tonight with us as we seek the Lord? And I want you to do business with God in your own heart. It's been a great privilege to preach today. I thank the pastor for, our pastor, for allowing me to have this opportunity. And I trust that something that's been said tonight in this message can, will help you and stir you and point you back to a place that God wants you to be. And as our pianist plays softly tonight, and <coughs> we don't have to necessarily have a scene, but we can just play along something of her choosing with our heads bowed and eyes closed tonight how far have you drifted how far have you drifted have you left your first love do you remember recall do you recall that love at the first of your Christian life here we are facing a brand new year and this is a great time for God's people to go back and say I want, I want to go back to that love at the first I want to renew that passion, that zeal. I want God to help me. I want the Lord to restore the joy of my salvation. I want the Lord to create a right spirit within me 
Some of you have the wrong spirit. It's evident. You can see it. You can hear it. You can hear it. Criticism. Negativism. Slander. All just... You can hear it. God needs to touch our hearts again. God needs to touch our mouths again. God needs to touch our minds. We need the mind of Christ. We need a heart for God. Amen? A heart for God. I think the message has been very clear. Tonight, if God has spoken to your heart without delay, quickly, would you, in just a moment, as we stand, would you leave your place and come and just find a private place on this altar a place you can point back to one day and say, that's the place of renewal in my life. It's a place I made some things right. It's a place I made, it's a place I made some resolutions. Let's all stand together across this auditorium. Lord, I'm coming home tonight as Miss Laura plays. Would you leave your place and come? No begging, no pleading. If God has spoken to your heart, do it quickly. Without delay, leave your place and come. Find a place to pray. Some of you have burdens that you need to bring to this altar. Some of you have 